When I was a little boy, <clears throat> 12 years of age, I've always been a sports nut, and I was, I've, and please pray for the Dallas Cowboys today. <laughs> but I've, uh, and I will ask you to have, you know, let's, let's not talk now. We got two, two or three folks, adults, been talking most of the service, and I won't hear what you have to say. I've cooked you a meal now. Please sit still and eat it. Um, I've been a sports nut all of my life. And I've often said I can see two doodlebugs running a race, and I'll stop and pull for one of them. I like sports. When I was a 12-year-old boy, Fordham University was playing Texas A&M in the Cotton Bowl on New Year's Day, the big annual Cotton Bowl game. You like the Rose Bowl, Orange Bowl, Sugar Bowl, and so forth. And uh, one day I picked up the sport page and read it. And it said they were having a nationwide contest for little boys. said the <clears throat> little boy in America that could write the best essay on an imaginary interview with the captain of the Fordham University football team, Fordham's in New York City. At the time, Jim Crowley was the coach of the team. He was one of the famous four horsemen from Notre Dame when he was younger. Um, the boy that writes the best essay on an imaginary, an imaginary interview with the captain of the Fordham team, whose name was Lou DeFilippo. The ushers, that's what you're there for, is to help the folks find a seat when they come in. And uh, so uh, we um, will we'll get, you, you, we'll win a prize, and we'll be mascot for the uh, Fordham University team on New Year's Day in the Cotton Bowl. Well, late one night, I got a piece of newspaper. We didn't have any paper at our house, and I got a piece of newspaper. And I um, um, wrote on the newspaper an imaginary interview with Lou DeFilippo, the center and captain of the Fordham team. We didn't have a telephone at our house, and so in the wee hours of the morning, the neighbors across the street came running over and said, it's a long-distance telephone call for Jack Hyams. Well, we were very, very poor people and couldn't afford telephones, so I went across, and it was a long-distance call from New York City. Good night, a long-distance call from New York City for me, little old Jack Hiles, 12-year-old poor kid down Texas. I picked it up, and a fellow said, this is the sports writer for certain, certain Associated Press, United Press, or something, and said, of all the boys in America who have submitted imaginary interviews or essays, yours has been chosen as the winning essay. Well... That meant that I was going to really be wined and dined for several days. So, uh, Jim Crowley, uh, that, um, I spent about a half a day with Jim Crowley, the coach of the football team. As I said, he was one of the famous four ho horsemen from the University of Notre Dame. Grantland Rice, who's the most famous sports writer who ever lived, took me out to eat lunch. I led the parade downtown at the front of the fire truck with a big Texas cowboy hat. It was too big. It came down over my ears and and chin, and uh, <clears throat> I led the parade out in front of the fire, on the, on, uh, the front of the uh, hood of the fire truck, and uh, then um, I was on 169 stations interviewed by the famous Bill Stern, who was the most, most famous sportscaster in, in, in America at that time, and he interviewed me on 169 stations. Uh, Knox Gelatin Company, Knox Jello Company, Jim Knox was the man who was sponsoring the uh, nationwide radio broadcast of the game. I met him, and he sent us enough jello to last us. Well, in fact, it didn't last us long. That's all we had to eat was jello. And he, he uh, gave me a, <coughs> a little sweater, and uh, it said to Jackie Boy Hiles from Jim Knox, the owner of the Knox Gelatin Company. And uh, then on New Year's Day, I sat on the bench with the Fordham team, and sat right there, I mean, with the, with all the players, uh, all-American uh, uh, halfback named Jim Blumenstock, and uh, then there was a uh, all-American quarterback, I think, named Lynn Eshmont, and the center was all-American, Lou DeFilippo, and I was the mascot as a little 12-year-old boy on the bench. Well, when it's all over, everybody, now they, they, for, for two weeks, they'd wine me and dine me, literally tried, tried to make me take a drink, no joke. And... Uh, I had been with the football team almost continually. I'd been on the practice field and everything for two weeks. When it was all over, they took off. And 
I was standing out there in the middle of the cotton bowl, and nobody thought to tell me what to do. Now, they brought me to the, to the cotton bowl in a taxi cab, <laughs> but I had no way to get home. I had no car fare, and now I was standing out there in the middle of the cotton bowl football field, and everybody gone. I went home, got away home, and uh, mother said, son, welcome home. And I felt an empty feeling. And I began to cry. And I cried, and I couldn't stop it. And I couldn't understand why. <laughs> and mother sat me down and said, <coughs> son, this is a natural feeling. <laughs> when something big has just ended. And I said, I wanted it to go on and on and on and on and on. And Mother said, Son, nothing goes on and on and on and on. She said, This is a natural letdown feeling. <laughs> Last year, about this time, Mother went to Texas and spent uh, ten days in Texas. And twice a year, uh, I helped send Mother and Earlene down there and put them up in a nice hotel somewhere and pay their plane fare. <laughs> And, uh, of course, they have friends all down there, and Mother's from that part of the country. And uh, so when they got home, I went over to see Mother. And I said, Mother, welcome home. Mother said, Thank you. And I said, Mother. She said, Jack, I don't know what's wrong. And I said, Mother, that's just a natural thing <laughs> that, that happened. <laughs> now, there she is, 140 years old, still having the same <coughs> the same problem. And... Uh, and I, I gave to her the same little speech she gave to me 37 years ago. That natural let-down feeling. Christmas night, late at night, I <coughs> walked in the living room. All the lights were out but the Christmas tree lights. And the fireplace was burning. And nobody was in the living room but Becky and Linda and Cindy. And they were lying down. One, one in front of the fireplace and one over in front of the Christmas tree and one, I think, on the sofa. And there was that strange silence Christmas night. And I sat down and I could feel it in the air. You felt it, didn't you? Huh? Christmas night. And so I got to talking. And I said, you know, every once in a while when something big is over... <laughs> I get an empty feeling. You girls ever get that? And I said, you know what I do? I always, before something big starts, I plan something to do immediately when it ends. And I sat there and lectured for a little while because I felt there were three t uh, young ladies that needed to have a little talk about that. And one of the girls <coughs> said, Dad, how did you get so smart? Well... Just that way, you can't help it. You got it, you got it, and uh, and uh, so uh, <clears throat> I uh, we talked. To, I, I I talked to them a few minutes and and explained it to them. Did you know that that's human nature has been that way ever since it's been a person on the face of the earth? Did you know that's what the wise man Solomon was saying in, the, in our text a while ago? He that hath a merry heart hath a continual feast. But I don't want Christmas to end. When you get my age, you will. When you when you when you when you have to pay for them, and and you when you're the guy that has to come down that messy chimney, then you <laughs> will be uh, you'll be glad to see it end. But anyway, it's a natural thing. And by the way, you can call it the blahs if you want to. Or you can say, uh, if you want to, uh, it's a blue Monday. Or you can say, I've got that let down feeling. Or maybe you word it, I'm just washed out today. Or maybe you word it, um, I've got the blues today. Whatever it is, all of us face it at this time of the year. And you felt it, most of you did, Christmas night. Many a little boy and girl Christmas night went to bed with tears in his eyes or her eyes because it's all over. The Jews had the same problem. And Solomon, <coughs> the wise man, was trying to combat that problem when he said, He that hath a merry heart 
at the continual feast. He wasn't talking about a feast like we'd say, Boy, what a feast we're having here. We're feasting. No, he was talking about a real feast. You see, the Jews had some wonderful times as a nation. They had, for example, what they had a Sabbath day. Six o'clock every Saturday night, their Sabbath, every Friday night, <clears throat> their Sabbath day started. And for from six o'clock Friday night to six o'clock Saturday night, it was a special time. Nobody could light a fire in the house. Nobody could pick up sticks. Nobody could work. Nobody could go over 2,000 cubits away from his own house. That's about uh, uh, 3,000 feet or two-thirds of a mile. Nobody could go farther than that. You couldn't walk any farther than 2,000 feet from your own house. It was a Sabbath day. It was a wonderful day, a time of rest, a time the family got together, a time that the synagogue had its worship time. It was a wonderful day, and it would be mighty easy for the Jews at the end of that kind of a day to have the blahs or have the feeling that I had at the end of the cotton bowl, or that Mama had at the end of her trip, or that you had on Christmas night. The Jews then had uh, what they call a sabbatical year. Once every seven years, every seventh year, the land rested, and it was a special year. They had a, a year of jubilee that came every 50 years. It was a wonderful time. I mean, it was the great time of the half century, the year of jubilee. They had what was called the Passover time. That was the day on the first month of the year, the tenth day of the month, that took, each family took a lamb, a lamb without blemish, a male lamb without blemish, and kept that lamb for examination and scrutinization for four days. And on the fourteenth day of the first month, it was offered as a sacrifice, and then it was roasted whole and eaten. It was roasted whole as a symbol of Christ, who was going to become the Lamb of God, Christ our Passover, 1 Corinthians 5, 7 says. And it was eaten with uh, unleavened bread. And bitter herbs, unleavened bread, a symbol of purity. Bitter herbs, a reminder of the bitterness they had back in Egypt and how the Passover lamb delivered them from the bitterness of Egypt and, and delivered them to a life of holiness and purity. And it was a wonderful season. They were singing. And all the, all the male adults had to go to Jerusalem during this time of the Passover at least one time and go to the tabernacle of the house of God and present themselves there. Three times a year they had these wonderful feasts. The second feast is what was called the Feast of Weeks. You might want to call it the Feast of Pentecost. It started 50 days after the Passover. Then again all the male adults went down to Jerusalem. And again there was a time of festivity. And again there was a happy time. It was a combination of a, a county fair and a religious revival and a, a, a family reunion and a the Fourth of July picnic all wrapped up in one blessed package. And mm, it'd be over. And they'd go home, and boys and girls would say goodbye to friends they'd met for a, for, for a week. And fathers went back to their work, and mothers went back to their duties, and sometimes that empty feeling came to them. There was the Feast of Tabernacles, the seventh month and the fifteenth day of that month. For fifteen days the Israelites dwelled in booths that find out find clear places in Jerusalem or upon top of houses that build booths, and there they would go in the little uh, booth, each, each uh, found in a little booth, and they'd dwell and worship God and and once again, all the male adults had to go to Jerusalem. There are many other days. They have atonement. And other days. These were sacred times, gala occasions, holy times, reunion times. Now, wait a minute. Can you picture a family leaving Jerusalem and going back home? And can you imagine... Little boys and girls said, Mama, I just feel like crying. Uh, the other day, I preached at the Southwide Baptist Fellowship in, in Louisville, Kentucky. Our choir went, and if you'll let me say this, I probably shouldn't, but I think I will. It illustrates exactly what I'm trying to say. Linda, who's 18, a freshman in college, and in the choir, <coughs> she... Uh, she said, Dad, could I stay and fly home with you? And I said, well, of course you can. And so when the, when the young people left to come back on the buses, uh, uh, Linda stayed and, and we had lunch together and spent a little time together and flew back to Chicago. And it was just a half a day or so. We got to O'Hara Field. We are walking to the car. Tom McKinney met us at the airport. And we are riding up the escalators. And then they said, Dad, I think I'm going to cry. I said, why? Why are you going to cry, sweetheart? 
And she said, I hate to see this day end. I hate to see this day end. That's the way all of us have felt. 